Well, hello and welcome back, or welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time to Hope Revealed. I'm your host, Matt Crump, and I come to you every Tuesday with episodes of Hope, Help, and Health. You can expect guests to give us great information and insight in the world of business, health, and personal experience, all presented to you as a way to find a Hope Revealed. As a person myself who's been battling stage four cancer, I wanted to bring a platform to you that would specifically bring hope as well as help. That can be done through our special guests, information I've been able to locate, and information from emails and messages I receive from you, our followers. You can always email us here at community at godsgotthis.love for questions, comments, or content. On today's episode, we're going to dive deep into life and a hope revealed moment through the life of a very special guest. Welcome to Hope Revealed. Hello, you awesome friends. My name is Edward Zier, and I'm a marketing mentor and master coach, and I was a homeless veteran some time ago, and I'm with the awesome Matt Crump to tell my story to help inspire you to win in your own unique way. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Hope Revealed, and I am super excited because I get to have my friend, Edward Gia, who's over here. Oh, I pointed the right way this time, over here, there. <laughs> yes, and he comes from uh, he comes from down under. He works at Outback Steakhouse. No, I'm sorry, that's American. He works <laughs> all over the place, but he's from the beautiful, beautiful land of Australia. And uh, we're super excited to have you here today on Hope Revealed, Edward, and uh, um, love for people just to get a chance to, to meet you and know who you are and what you're doing in life. And you've got an incredible story that we get, we're able to share with folks today. And, uh, you know, first of all, I'd just like to find out um, who's Edward? Oh, uh, Matt, you were too kind, and it's an honor to be on your show. I just want to say, Matt, I've noticed something. Your viewers are very attractive people. Have you ever noticed that, Matt? <laughs> There's no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> very attractive. So whoever watches your show is very attractive. Yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm a marketing mentor and master coach. Um, I help people all across the world become master persuaders and influencers. And, uh, yeah, I suppose uh, my, in my own story in terms of uh, Hope Reveal, which I'm very excited about, is, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I served. I was a homeless veteran just over 10 years ago, and my whole – last decade you would see it say has been one of hope and redemption and turnaround and i'm just excited to talk to you and your very attractive viewers about that today matt awesome pause i just need your pager is it going said on it, it be. i just paid you let you know they started i called your cell phone as well but it's okay okay I love the accent. Oh, what's that? I love, oh, I just called your pager. <laughs> that accent's cool. What is that? Welcome to the South, what? buddy. Okay, is that a Southern accent? Yeah, is it, it is. It's North Carolina. Oh, I just called your pager, and then I left the message on your cell phone. <laughs> it's, awesome. it's, like, it's awesome. It's awesome like here. TV. It's awesome here, an Australian accent trying to do a Southern accent at the same time. <laughs> That's so amazing. It's like our friend from Australia that you know, uh, my buddy KJ Wong. He's an incredible <laughs> businessman there in Australia. He lives in the Sydney area. Um, but when I first saw uh, KJ, I was able to talk to a guy who is a uh, an Asian Australian. So to have an uh, Asian guy with an Australian accent was just amazing to me to be able to hear something like that. You know? Well, my wife's Chinese, so same thing. She's um, she is Chinese, she's, right? Yeah. So to give you some context, over ten percent of the Australian population is Asian because we're like part of Asia, basically, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of a lot of Asians live here. Over one in ten people are Asian in Australia. Really? Yeah, I, yeah, I did, really, yeah, you're right. I never did think about that. And actually, I'm just a Southern guy down here, you know. So, so all right. So your wife's Chinese now. That's interesting to me. How did you meet her? Well, I actually met her at a business networking event, which is awesome. So what what was the event? How long ago was that? Well, that was about maybe we've been married for about uh, we've been together for about four years now. So about four or five years ago. We actually met at a business networking event, and um, I first noticed her as a very slender and beautiful Australian Asian woman, so he caught my eye. <laughs> so she caught my wandering, um, sinful gaze, and um, my extremely sinful gaze, I may add, and um, after I repented to our Lord and Saviour, we... Over time, we actually, we actually lost seeing each other, but we we're friends on Facebook. And one time, we just started talking over, over Facebook, and it just morphed into a date, and it was awesome. And the rest is history. Because what it is is that we're 
when we met, we were both over 35. Uh, and that, you know, when you're that age, what I think is really interesting is that, um, and this is funny, we actually spoke about kids on first date. That's how, that's how ready we are to have kids. I'm not kidding. I, no, but I'm laughing because I, I understand why. You're like, I'm not here to play around anymore. We're done. Like, is this going to be real or not? If it is, are we going to have kids? So, okay, whatever. Tell me, yeah, you're at that point. It's sort of like, look, is this going to work out or not? Yes or no? If you don't want me, I'm going to go right now. That's fine. No hard feelings. Tell me. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so easy. So easy. Oh, yeah, I like it. I, love, I just love that directness and speed. It was great. Um, woman of my dreams, amazing woman. Um, and, and, and actually, and um, she's, I've become, or I should say, I'll say I, but I mean that in a weave sense. Of also, I've become really successful lately. And she's a rock. She's a pillar. Like, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her support. So, you know, I believe... Um, behind every successful man is an even more successful woman. I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah, no doubt. And that's one of the things that really um, excited me about your wife. Her, her name's, you say Lassie or how do you say Lassie? Lassie as in the dog. Yes, yes it's Lassie. the same name. That's what I thought. Didn't want to say it the wrong way and be like, oh man, is it Lassie the dog? But um, one of the things, my first experiences with her was reading uh, something that she wrote about you. And... Um, mm -hmm what she wrote about you was basically just how much of an incredible guy you are and how much she loves you and how much she cares about you and how, how passionate she is about being behind you uh, to help make you the success that you are. And it was just a powerful story about what marriage should be, what, what it should look like. And it's just a blessing to see how, how she's there to support you. And what you're doing um, is not always easy. Uh, and it requires oh, yeah. a lot of time, a lot of effort. And if people aren't on the same page, especially in relationships, it could tear them apart. Yeah, totally. So I think, I think it was important. I think, you know, in honoring that, and I absolutely admire her respect in that, right? I think it comes down to this is that there have been times in my business where I haven't done a very good job. Right, where I haven't put in 100%, where I've held myself back, where I'm the problem, I'm, 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 I'm where I've been the problem. And rightfully so, people are fully entitled to get annoyed with you. However, to the opposite though, when you're putting in 110%, um, it's easy for people to get behind you, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So if you're doing a half ass effort, people are going to get rightfully annoyed at you, and so they should. But if you're going for it with everything you've got, People, I find, just naturally get behind you because they know they give you. They know that you're giving it your best, and people respect that and admire that. And I think it's great. No, absolutely. I'm actually glad we're talking. I, we didn't plan on this, but it's a great. It's a great opportunity. There's so many folks that'll be watching Hope Revealed today, and I know for a fact, being a pastor myself, how many people have difficulties in their marriage over disagreements. Um, people that don't fully understand or comprehend what the other person's doing or don't care. <laughs> um, there's a lot of those things that happen inside of relationships. And to be a successful entrepreneur, to have a successful business, if you're married, the only way to be successful is to have unity and harmony at home. I think, I think harmony, but also disharmony is good at times, right? Well, and iron sharpens iron. That's what it's called. That could be a good thing for sure. Yeah, so I'm gonna have a shot at myself here, right? I'm gonna have a complete shot at myself here. Uh, and so, okay, I can look you and your viewers in the eye right now, and I'm putting in 110% right now. No one's gonna debate that. No one doubts that, right? Everyone knows I'm putting in 110% right now. I haven't always been like that, right? And there have been times where my wonderful wife Lassie has rightfully, and I say rightfully, been annoyed at me because I haven't been putting in 110%. Right, and I regret those moments, and I was completely wrong. And the thing that I've learned is, I think I love harmony and disharmony. So when someone's doing the wrong thing, I think there should be maximum disharmony, right? Yeah, or I think the word that I would choose would be accountability. I think it's oh, I accountability. It. It. Yeah, and it's yeah. really the blessing to have someone that you could love and trust to have that accountability. It doesn't always huh. feel good. It sucks sometimes when they say it, but to know that they have your best interest at heart is important, right? Even when you're like, oh, shut up, I don't want to hear about it, right? But yeah, yeah. sometimes you have to hear about it. And also too as well on that one, Matt. And again, you're a pastor. You know way more about scripture than I do, right? And uh, But I will say this to me. I always look at suffering and pain in a very biblical sense. So I see suffering and pain as a gift from God to make us stronger. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, you never know how good good is without bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, actually, just to give some commentary on that one. Um, 
so so we so I come from an Iranian heritage as an Iran, right? So I um, come from you know even though I'm a Christian, come from an Islamic sort of background, an Islamic sort of country, right? And what I find interesting is one thing that I love about Islam of all things is, and this is what I find fascinating is. I love their take on pain. So I've got a lot of uh, Muslim friends and a lot of Muslim clients, and they have a very, very different interpretation on pain than a lot of people in the West do. And I just want to share it with you. I think it's amazing. I've learned a lot from this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Even though I'm a Christian, I've learned a lot from Islam. And what it is is this is that they see pain as a gift from God. And when you ask them that, what do you mean by that? They say, well, the pain is making me a better person and the pain is giving me an opportunity to come closer to God. I think that's powerful, and that and that message from Islam has actually helped me a lot as a Christian. I think it's great. No, I I totally relate with that. I can understand it for sure, and, and yeah. a lot of that comes to um, there's a difference between between people that are sold out for what they're doing and understanding versus people that are religious. And religious doesn't mean Christian. It means there's religious Islam, there's religious Christian, there's religious Jewish. There's religion is when you are so overboard with stuff that you're yes. you're uh, the one phrase that we use i don't know if you've ever heard it there in australia is that sometimes you are so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good oh say that again i love it say it again that's awesome say it again that was good sometimes you are so heavenly minded yeah you're no earthly good oh I, it's funny that's you say good. that actually it's funny you say that it's i think it's when people lose the plot and i think to me what it's all about like you know spirituality religion whatever if you care about the person next to you, you're there. That's that's the way I tend to see it, right? Regardless yeah. of whatever you call yourself, if you care about your neighbours and the person next to you, life's going to work out for everyone. Things going to be great for people. And I think if you do that and keep your heart in the right place, that's what builds a good community and great civilization. Oh, absolutely. Oh, by the way, folks, this is quite an interesting uh, version of Hope Revealed today. I am not in my studio normally, as you can tell. There's noise and stuff in the background here, and I'm probably being disrupted to other people. But I am at uh, Duke Hospital. I've been here for some treatment the other day for my stuff with cancer, and one of my best friends is here uh, for a surgery, and I'm here to help him uh, as he goes through the surgery and comes out. And uh, Edward today is at a, a coffee shop, which is a pretty popular one there in Australia. What was it called again? Oh, no, it's not a coffee shop. I'm at a beautiful four-and-a-half-star hotel. Uh, it's called the Novotel in Parramatta, and Parramatta is in Western Sydney. So um, Edward is living at large today. So you're telling oh, me that man. you're drinking like a, a $75 cup of coffee right now. Uh, four dollars. So four Australian dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. So four- and it's a small coffee, so probably probably three twenty US. That's uh, a this good coffee, deal. This coffee. That's $3. a really good twenty deal. US. But it's a good it. coffee. It's a it's a French hotel. And the French know how to make coffee, so they do. And I like my stuff strong, so that's probably really good, right? There you go. But I've got to say, um, I just have to say to you, bless your heart, Matt. Um, I know you, I know you're going to be around for a long time, and um, I just want to say prayers to your friend. I hope your friend knocks whatever he's got pretty quickly. Yeah, thank you. Um, some folks that had been following me over the past few years, we had a uh, we had a site that was called Two Sick Guys and a Camera, and it was. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> funny. Traveled, that's, that's, traveled, that's tragically funny. It was hilarious, and we're very sarcastic. And I used to dog him out a lot. It was hilarious, but he uh, he needed a kidney transplant, and of course, I've got stage four cancer, so. He would bring me to the hospital for, for all my cancer stuff. I would come here for him with his kidney stuff. And we worked. I was going to I was gonna donate my kidney to him because he needed a, a kidney and couldn't find a match. So I was going to give him a kidney. But then turns out I got cancer right at my my first tumor at my kidney. So my adrenal gland, my muscle wall. I, and, of course, I was knocked out altogether. I couldn't give him anything because I had cancer. Uh, so wow. that was a bummer. So we traveled around with our story all the time with two sick guys and a camera. Uh, until eventually he got his kidney uh, replaced and we just called it two guys and a camera, right? We moved it from the sick guys because he was getting better. But today he's here because he had a, an issue with his uh, parathyroid gland, had had that removed and he's having those removed today. Yeah. Is he a veteran, right? Is that, um, is this from the war, is it? Or um, Yeah, I'm a vet, as you are, which I'd love to talk about that in a second. So yeah, I served yeah. during the Gulf War, which is back in uh, 1991. I believe, 
Um, I was stationed in Berlin, Germany at the time, which was, we were an occupying force of Berlin with the Berlin Wall. Of course, the wall came down in 89. So um, when the wall came down in 89, which I was there for that as well, um, we kind of had a job change. I was there to do some, some really incredible stuff when the wall was up, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to go there. I did Russian war tactic training prior to that and did a lot of things with, uh, you know, how to, anyway, long story. This is what's about you, not about me, but it was a really fun time. Got to go into Gulf War and uh, after that, I got out and uh, got my degree, my MDiv. I have a master's divinity in, in uh, theology and biblical counseling. And I was wow. going to go back as a chaplain in the military and never went back in. I've been a pastor so the whole time. And um, and here I am. So, And, of course, I'm now medically retired from the military from all the problems I've had while I was in the Army and, of course, now the cancer that I'm fighting. But um, for you, you were in the military, right? Like Australia has a military. Yeah. Yes, yes. And just on that note, Australia actually is what's called a rifleman um, military. So the Australian Army, for example, is all built around riflemen and it's all based on guerrilla tactics and guerrilla warfare. Very, so the actual training for the Australian Army is actually completely different to the US Army, for example. Um, so, for example, um, I'll use Vietnam War as an example. The Australian Army tactics weren't too far off the Viet Cong tactics. They're actually similar armies. Both are guerrilla resistance sort of fighters. So, for example, when I was in the Australian Army, before I became an engineer, in a lot of the training you do, it's all based on hit-and-run tactics, hiding in the forest. It's all complete guerrilla warfare, which is incredible. Yeah, no doubt. Whereas here we are in the Gulf War, and we're in the little desert, and there is no jungle. <laughs> it's just yeah. dirt and sand and mountains. So yeah. a little so, bit different difference in training. And it's funny, Australia, a lot of the Australian tactics would be stuff like sneak in, plant a bunch of claymores, and get out of there, set up an ambush, ambush, run for it. That's basically Australian Army, all kit and run guerrilla tactics. Which we did a lot of that. I was infantry, so uh, there was a lot of our training similar with that. And of course, our special forces and whatnot. But So how long were you in the military then in Australia? Yeah, so I was in the, um, just, um, just over three years, just over three years. And um, originally, actually, I was an engineer in the army, which basically means um, I dig holes, put up fences, basically a labourer, right? Right, um, right. Same so, thing here. Yeah, so, yeah, so combat engineer, so labourer, right? So basically digging holes, building fences, that sort of thing. And so I was uh, like a private, which is called a, a sapper, which is like an engineer private. And sort of what happened to me was I was very, based on my heritage, so I come from a sort of a Iranian Islamic sort of background. Based on my heritage, I was very lucky to be picked up by the people in Canberra. Now, just to let you know, Canberra is like your Washington. It's the, the head of our country. And so I was very lucky to work with the federal government on a lot of task forces, um, doing drug enforcement, anti-terrorism, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. That's the fun stuff, so that, too. Yeah, so that was my special um, black ops sort of days, which is very, very cool. Um, <laughs> but just to let you know, no one told me that doing undercover drug work was dangerous. It turns out it was. <laughs> yeah, you think, right? <laughs> yeah. So tell me about so that I, time. I mean, you had, uh, you had that time in the military, but then, but then you got out and you came back home and you ran into some, some issues in your life. What, what, was, what happened then? Well, what happened was um, I got injured very badly on a bad drug sting, very, like, as in almost killed, like as in al almost killed in coma on the edge of living uh, in a bad drug sting, right? Very bad drug sting. I was out for a long time. And what happened to me was that um, I was very sick for a short while. The Australian government was really good and I sort of got back on track. And I ended up basically going, going to uni, finishing my degree, and I ended up having a very, very successful corporate career. However, and I know you'd appreciate this one, uh, Matt, is um, I had um, basically complex battlefield PTSD. So what happened was in my late 20s, I had a massive relapse of PTSD and I ended up losing everything. So I lost my job, lost all my money, and I was, very, I was a homeless guy. So I went from successful six-figure corporate in my 20s. I don't... I basically got out, had a very successful corporate career. Then the PTSD, which was untreated, then just took me over. I lost everything very quickly. Wow. Um, yeah, and I went from like six figures to, in a very short space of time, to be a guy living in my car. Yeah, so it was a complete change of life, right? A complete change. So I remember having my 30th, um, I was about to say, yeah, my 30th uh, in my car, you know, just on my own. And I was a, well, I was a homeless vagabond. Yeah, it was crazy. But it was also equally awesome as well for different reasons. Oh, I'm sure. There's a lot of things that can happen in a situation like that. 
so after you got out of the military, there was a lot of things that occurred in your life, right? There was some stuff that was quite, quite interesting. Obviously, the name of the show is Hope Revealed. And um, there were some, some kind of dark moments that happened there, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a very successful corporate career. And uh, what happened towards sort of my late 20s, uh, what happened was a lot of my untreated PTSD, post tra- complex battlefield, post-traumatic stress disorder, really started to kick in and i was very very sick i was having three panic attacks a day that's how bad it was wow um so have you seen you've seen iron man right you know of, um yeah. tony stark and all that aren't you iron you were iron man right oh, i so wish i said so robert downey jr right i love robert Downey. Ro- <laughs> easy after right yeah remember in a few times he has panic attacks where he actually does the whole eh, like that in it right yeah yeah i used to get that three times a day right exactly wow. that i would just be sitting there and I'd literally just go, eh, and I'd be totally immobilized. So I was very sick, very, very sick. Those conditions led to me being a homeless veteran. And um, I made some bad choices too, so I'm not just going to pin it on what happened in my condition. But what was interesting was about that. It was, yeah, I've always been a Christian. And to me, the big thing was interesting was that in terms of being hope revealed, I was always very, very biblical about it. I was always like, you know, always playing about it, always reflecting about it. And even though a lot, and this is another thing that I say to a lot of people, a lot that surprise a lot of people. Even though a lot of people uh, think, "Oh my God, Ed, it must have been so terrible for you losing everything," I actually wasn't that unhappy because my life kind of sucked anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of cleaned so the slate, huh? It, it was. So it wasn't like, "Oh my God, I had the best life life ever, and I lost everything." I was sort of in a way. Well, good riddance. At least I can start again and do what I want for a change. Oh, wow. So I wasn't as unhappy. I was actually, uh, part of me is actually quite relieved because it was, because I wasn't, I wasn't happy in my life anyway. It was a chance for me to hit that reset button and say, okay, I'm like 30, right? I'm 41 now, right? Um, I'm 30. What do I want to do with my life? And that was that reset button and, you know, praying to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and all that, that gave me that unique perspective that helped me set things in a new direction. And what, what's interesting about it is that um, I actually worked this out the other day. In my business, I've stopped at least 10 people from committing suicide. I should work that out the other day. That's awesome. Yeah, if I was still, if I wasn't doing what I was doing, those 10 people would probably be dead. So it's incredible when I look at it in those absolutist life and death sort of terms. Oh, no doubt. I mean, there's many times that when there's doors that are open in front of us, if we choose not to go through them. There's, there's consequences that are, are, are much bigger than our own lives for sure. Um, yeah. I'm thinking a couple of things here now, of course, with the, uh, well, let's talk before I go there. Uh, you told me that you were homeless. So yes, that's right. how, did, how did that happen? Yes. Yeah, so what to me was that, um, I was making, I was, as I was going insane, I was wasting all my money on crazy stuff, you know, finishing up at my job. And what happened to me was, um, I lit- my money just ended very quickly, right? And it was just me and my car. So I had my car. And what it was was that um, when I sort of finished what I was doing, I was in a place called uh, Hobart. So for those that don't know, you know Tasty Devil? You know from Warner Brothers? You know oh, yeah. Tasty Devil? That talk- he goes, Tasmanian that's what Devil. Devil. That's right. I was actually in Tasmania at the time. So, so you know Australia, that little island on the bottom of Australia? I was actually in there at the time. That's where Tasmanian Devil's from. That, rah, he does that little tornado. Oh, wow. So I was actually in Tasmania. And what happened was I literally just um, sold a bit of my stuff. What, I didn't have my stuff anyway. And I just literally packed my cars, whatever I had, and I just left and I just drove. And I just thought, where am I going to go with my life? And one place that always appealed to me was Sydney. So I'm from Melbourne originally, but Sydney always appealed to me. Like, um, How far is Melbourne anyways, from Sydney? Oh, it's about a, about a 10 hour drive, about a 10 okay. hour drive. So you took off and you headed to Sydney. Yeah, so what I did was I actually took the ferry to Melbourne and then I slowly walked my way and I decided where I'm going to um, go of my life, like where I'm going to go. Um, I actually considered going to the Middle East, Dubai, that was an option. Oh, beautiful. Um, but I thought, no, nah, I just had this calling to go to Sydney. So I just made my way to Sydney and so I'm starting my life again. Wow. And I was just living in my car, you know, counting my pennies, saying, okay, let's do this. Yeah, let's, think, Amazing. let's think about things for a while. Yeah. So that was the homeless time. You didn't really have a place to go. You didn't have a place to lay your head. You just kind of from place to place. And yeah. how long was that period of time where you just didn't really have a, a place to call home? Oh, three, about 10 months, about 10 months, yeah. you know, 
so it wasn't, and, and, and to clarify, and I just want to make this point, um, was I technically homeless? Yeah, but it actually wasn't as bad as it sounds because here's the point. Um, I had a car, right? So I wasn't like living in cardboard boxes. I had a car to arrest him, which is actually um, homeless. And I was homeless in style. So what I mean by homeless in style, <laughs> in Sydney, there's this place called DY. Um, and I'll tell you now, it's one of the most beautiful beaches ever. So I thought, I want to be a homeless guy on the beach. So I just, so I lived on the beach as a homeless guy, right? You're such and, a planner. You're such a planner. And you're like, okay, I'm going to plan. Now I'm going to be a homeless guy on the beach. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so I thought, okay, I'm a homeless guy. So you got to accept reality. I'm a homeless guy. And I thought, I kind of want to rebeat my life. I want to think about things. It's like, what I said to myself was that when I lost everything, and as I told you before, I wasn't too worried. I wasn't like, oh, I lost my, my life kind of sucks. So I didn't care too much. <laughs> so I was, yeah, I just being honest with you. So I'm like, okay, I want to start my life again. So I thought, I want to go. So Hobart's, a, just to clarify, Hobart's a very cold place, very cold place, right? And so I decided I'm going to go somewhere nice and warm. I want to like, I want to think. I just want to think about my life. And I said, the last thing I wanted to do is just get a job or something. I want to plan the rest of my life. And I actually consider a few things. I actually consider being a pastor, consider being a pastor, consider being a counselor. But I thought I want to be some kind of coach that helps people. And yeah. And eventually I just... I was just on the beach and then eventually I just got crappy jobs. I, I used to sell, um, I used to be one of those annoying guys in shopping malls that would try and sell health products. <laughs> Basically one of those guys. So I'd be, so when I first got a job again, um, you know, because I've always been quite, one thing that helped me get, I've always been quite charming and charismatic. So I've always been good at sales. So I just got a job like selling it, you know, like back, like massage machines. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> And like you know those little hot packs that you click and they like, heat up and you put them on your neck and shit, you know stuff like that. And I was just one of those annoying guys selling shit in the shopping malls, and I just—that's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I could imagine seeing you. Oh, hello, beautiful. Hello, awesome, awesome, Matt. Would you like to try a massager today? Yeah, I could yeah, see. Yeah, it. I was like, I was one of those guys, right? Oh my god. And, um, yeah, and from what little bit I know this, um. I was actually, um, I had a few things like that here. So I was living, I didn't tell people this. I was actually, at the time, I was very ashamed about living in my car. So I didn't tell anyone. That was a secret, right? Um, But now I think it's, in hindsight, I think it's funny. And I wish I owned it more (laughs) at the time. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yeah, so I just gave people a fake address, you know, just to make out I had somewhere to live where I did it. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Now, you, you said originally you were in the corporate world. So you came out of the military and you got a corporate job. So were you always like a guy who... I mean, did you have a corporate uh, training in your background? Did you go for a marketing sales and services degree or something? What, what made you want to go into corporate when you came out of the military? Well, yeah, what was interesting was that um, <clears throat> when, I, um, yeah, when, when I finished up in the military, which I said, which I, I regret, yeah, I was too sick to continue. I was very badly injured. Um, I was really heartbroken because I always wanted to be in the military and work for the government. And that door had closed, and I was aware of that. I was just way too messed up. Um, so what I decided to do was I was very lucky. I ended up getting, I actually did a degree in chemistry. I've always loved chemistry. Right? Hmm. And, um, I don't know if you got, I think you got in America. I was very lucky to get a job with this company called Henkel. Uh, Henkel is one of the world, it's German. It's one of the world's largest chemical companies. So in Europe, everyone knows Henkel. In Australia, Henkel's a big brand. And, um, in fact, I bet you probably a good chunk of your supermarket aisle it's like Procter & Gamble. A lot of products you'd be using would actually be owned by Henkel in America. Understand. Gotcha. And I got, a, I got a job in a lab there, which is awesome. So I was working in a lab. And because I had a good mouth, I was very good at this. Um, one day they fired me from the lab. They actually sat me down and said, Ed, you talk too much. And I was like, oh, I'm getting fired. <laughs> oh, not again. And then they turned around and said, but don't worry, Ed. We want to give you a $20,000 a year pay rise and give you a brand new car. I'm like, no way. And so they made me a sales guy, which was awesome, right? That's amazing. It's like you want a game show or something. A brand new car. A new car. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. So I was like 22, driving around a brand new car. It was awesome. It was funny. Very funny, right? Wow. Um, 
and that's how I got the marketing. Then I then I went to um, then I did a post grad. I don't know if you do you call them post grads in America. It's like when yeah, you're working your mas- time. after your bachelor's to go to masters or masters to yeah, doctorate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I did a post grad in marketing, and that just and that led me into corp- the corporate world, right? Yeah, and I actually I actually did really well in my corporate career. I was actually I actually ended up the marketing director at Rest Point Casino in Hobart. That's how we got to Hobart, where Tasty Devils from, you know the yeah, Daffy, yeah Daffy Duck. what an uh, amazing this, uh, this whole story. All, all, yeah, it's all coming full circle now. It's amazing. And then, uh, and then, of course, Lassie comes into your life uh, four how, five years ago, maybe, huh? About that long ago. Yeah, about, about four five years ago. Yes, yes. And were you already doing the uh, what you're doing now with with it, your brand with your of course your brand your name, but then you've got your marketing company. Where you, <laughs> did you already start that, or did that come after you got married, or how did that work out? I know what was good. So just to, I could be out on these. I'm just trying to get the time frame right. So pardon me and the viewers if I get the time frame slightly out. But what it was is that I started my business. I'm 40. Just to calibrate things, I'm 41 right now, right? To and I sort of understand my life in years. I started. I just say crappy jobs here and there. And I started my business when I was about about 34, 33, 34, right? After a few, I was, I was. Okay, I wasn't super successful when, but I was okay when I met Lassie. Uh, and when I met Lassie, then as we got together, got married, had children, with Lassie's support, help, and as, as I got better at what I did, by the way, things have just started to take off. So over the past six to 12 months, we've really taken off. So I used to just have clients in Sydney. Now I've got clients all across the world, which is awesome. Yeah, that is yeah. truly amazing. Uh, God's definitely been been good to you and blessed you in so many different ways. Well, I have another question for you that I'm going to ask, but I just I just been thinking about it while we've been talking, and I said I know people probably wonder this, and it's yeah. part of your branding, part of your imaging, and uh, you've got a little cartoon character of yourself that's part of what you do for your brand. And on that cartoon character, there is a red spot on your face. Don't move. I'm just going to get my business card with it and show everyone. So don't move. I'll be right back. It's just right behind the camera. Don't good, move. Good, good. I'll be right back. This is my business card. It's actually a credit card. It's pretty good. See? Oh yeah. There you go. Not you're not used for anything like that. We don't use it for stuff like that. You know, <laughs> drugs are bad. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had hair in those days, so now I'm a hot bald guy. Uh, we're we're at the logo. I had a bit of hair there, so a lot of people say I need to redo the logo of that hair because I. I'm, I'm now slimmer and I've lost the hair, so I've got to sort of redo yeah, it. Yeah, time for a new one. Yeah, so no, owning my birthmark. I'm, I've never had a problem with my birthmark, actually. I've always owned it. Um, yeah, that's amazing. You know, I yeah, assumed I it was a birthmark. Was... I assumed it was a birthmark, but I, I wondered about that in your life. Have it ever, ever caused any kind of uh, self-esteem issues or anything like that for you at all? Oh, as a, as a teen, uh, to be honest with you, as a teenager a little bit, but I don't know, sort of that. Uh, after 10, 18, just didn't care. Like the, um, it's funny you actually bring up, if I can um, slightly digress, I actually get contacted once a week on LinkedIn by people around the world saying, hey, I don't mind if you ask me, but I have a, I have a son or a daughter that has a similar birthmark to you. How can I help counsel my kids? And I said, I'll just get them to own it, right? I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because I, I thought about that with the people that, uh, and it's more than that. I, I was born actually with a, with a, a birthmark. My entire forehead all the way down, oh, really? I had what you had on your cheek, my all all here, and uh, for me, over, like a ragdoll cat, like a ragdoll yeah. cat almost. <laughs> but for somehow it it disappeared. But that would be to me no difference than somebody who is uh, extremely skinny, extremely fat, short, uh, awkward. I mean, fill in the blank, whatever. That there could be a, a an issue of self esteem or 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 awkwardness in your life. And uh, your point to that as a person who has something that's right on your face um, yeah. is own it. Yeah, and that's the thing. And owning it's um, uh, interesting. In fact, I was talking to one of my friends, actually, one of my very, very good friends. She shall remain nameless, but just acknowledging her. She's an amazing uh, Christian woman. She is a wonderful black American lady. And she's got the best accent ever. I won't try and imitate her because I'll just sound, it'll be like an Australian imitating an awesome black lady from Atlanta, right? <laughs> and she is awesome. She actually um, taught me a lot. Um, she knows who she is and she'll see it. I'm just acknowledging her, right? And she's like, I'm not going to try and imitate her accent, but I kind of want to. Um, <laughs> but she says, like, she goes, I'm quoting her. She goes, 
I'm big, I'm black, and I'm beautiful. And she just says it in the sassy way, right? And yeah, she, is, she, yeah. is, she is big, black, and beautiful. There's no question about it. And I've learned so much from her. So just listening to her totally own herself yeah, has yeah. helped me do that. And I think whatever you are, you need to own it. And I think it's very important. What I say, so I get contacted like, um, uh, you know, at least once a week by someone around the world. It's usually a father talking about their son. Sometimes it's a daughter, but usually it's about their son. For whatever reason, girls... I, again, I'm generalizing here. I don't mean to sound sexist or anything, but I kind of get the impression that girls don't care about it's boys that have the problem. It's just a, I could be wrong. That's just the view I've developed. And anyway, um, I could be wrong. It's just the view I've got. No, so just, I always say, a, that sounds like a whole new episode. That'd be a fantastic thing to dig into. But yeah, that's a great con. I think that's interesting to know that you're getting calls that are predominantly male. Um, yeah. I'm, I could understand that. I, I mean, I had a couple of things when I was a kid that, that bothered me and, uh, they caused a lot of self-esteem issues for me. I had a lot of hard problems. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to say is you just got to own what you have. So my awesome friend from Atlanta, she goes, I'm big, I'm black, and I'm beautiful. And she's awesome, right? And she actually is quite attractive for the record, right? An amazing lady, right? I have nothing with respect for her. You know, and whatever you are, you need to own it. Because what I mean is when you own it, that's when you become really powerful and successful, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so be it you're short, you're tall, you're big, you're small. You're white, you're black, whatever, who cares? When you own it, that's when you really develop that confidence. And um, yeah, I never really had a problem with my birthmark, right? I've always kind of owned that. My problems were more more about my con- my problems were more about my confidence um, and not believing in myself, which would have happened to me whether I had a birthmark or not. Yeah, absolutely. And to, yeah. to many of us, to many of us. Yeah. Well, you have you've shared lots of different, uh, we've talked about a lot of different scenarios today. And in, in all of them, there has been a hope revealed through all the scenarios, even through uh, your difficult times in the military and then corporate world and coming out of corporate world and then down to uh, Tasmanian devil land and then your trip up to the beach and being a homeless beach guy in a car. I mean, everything you did, maybe, I don't know if it was like, I mean, it probably was your personality type is you probably were right on at that time feeling that way. But to be, that's a positive outlook. And not everybody can be that positive. You're, you're really positive. Um, not everybody is. Well, just, just on that one, though, just on that one, though, is, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, and thank you. Um, I'm not positive. I play all the time. So the thing was is that all throughout that experience, regardless of how sick or anxious I was, and believe me, I was very sick from anxiety, very, very sick at times, very sick. Uh, I'd always be praying. I'd always be, you know, dear Lord, you know, I'm Christian. I'm, I'm a Christian, but whatever you believe in, but whatever you're into, right? Whatever you're into, I'd always be, I'd always be, dear Lord, dear Jesus, you know, help me, you know, guide me, you know. And I'll tell you now, I'll tell you now, and this is, again, the hope revealed. If it wasn't for my Christian faith, I, I would not be the man I am today. I, I may not even be, to be honest with you, if it wasn't for my Christian faith, I may not even be with you now to talk to you right? If you know what I mean. Sure do. So it's that Christian faith and, you know, Jesus that's kept me going. I always say to people, and it was what I say to people, whether you're a Christian or not, don't care. That's awesome. It's the high, it's the belief in the higher power that's to me very important. And however you language that, I absolutely respect it. So it's that belief in the higher power and the creator that makes us successful, especially yeah. in difficult times. No doubt. You had a, you had a source to plug into and then sometimes people don't have that source yeah, and they don't know how to get to that source. And that was a very impactful for you through the journey you had every time you had a choice to make and you could have made a bad choice uh, to fail, to die in the sense of failure, like, like no life, like, you know, die on the beach or have never met your wife and just be some bum somewhere. I mean, but you, you have made some choices through that relationship. Uh, to me, that's always about relationship. And that relationship is what really gave you the strength to persevere to where you're at today. And you now have a, a business that is successful and growing and uh, will continue to become more successful uh, as time goes by, no doubt, um, all through some of the choices you've made, uh, which is a mindset thing, right? Some folks on LinkedIn are saying, it's all mindset, it's all mindset, which is uh, true. Uh, I get I know, uh, but it's yeah. label yeah. whatever you wish. It, it really comes down to making some choices and some decisions. And, um, and you did, you made some decisions and you've made some very good ones. 
and we've made some bad ones and the, the bad ones sometimes are ones that help us to, to be even better than who we are right it's funny you say that I love, I love where you go Matt. you're a, you're a one smart great guy Matt. Um, <laughs> one thing i'll think that's really funny is there is no one that has screwed up their life more than i have there is no one i challenge your audience i'm the biggest failure there is no one has failed more than me and that's my challenge to the audience i am the biggest loser Ooh. out of everyone Man, I bet you there's some folks that might could challenge that. It's pretty amazing. Now, I'm I'm a bigger loser than anyone watching this. I'm 10 times the... This is to all your viewers. I'm 10 times the loser. You are. Wow. <laughs> and and why does that make you smile? Because it's a matter of owning it. And this is the actual point that I make, right? And I do this all the time. I have people every day who come to me, you know, head down... And they're all, they're all ashamed. And, and I mean, it's true. I say, I'm 10 times a bigger loser than you are. I've made bigger mistakes than you, right? Yeah, I've made mistakes that have led to the end of people, right? In my government days, I've made, I've made life and death mistakes, which I regret every day. Again, there is no, I, there's not many people on the planet that have made bigger mistakes than me, right? And the point is, is that, but I'll tell you the reason why I laughed a bit at the mindset comment. I'll tell you why I reacted. I, and I know you didn't mean this. I know you're... You know, you're demonstrating. I know you don't mean this. You're just doing this more for demonstrators' sake. Right. I really hate it when people say it's all mindset and it's all your choice. I don't actually agree with that, right? I think it's more, you know, it's your relationship with God. That's it. Because it's a very secular view like, oh, it's God's doing nothing. It's all just my choice. Oh, yeah, I don't agree with that. Right. I think the more we accept the higher power above us is, and the more we tap into that power, it's the stronger that we become. So, yes, I agree with mindset. Yes, I agree with the power of personal choice. But there's also the relationship with God, however people language it, that I don't think we talk about enough, especially in the Western world. No, it's very true. And bottom line is, it, the reality is a lot of people are just too afraid to speak about it because we're afraid to offend people. And, uh, and I don't want to either. I've been very careful about that here on LinkedIn. And I have many friends of different faiths that um, I absolutely love. Um, I do believe passionately in what I believe. Uh, there's no yeah. doubt I'm, I'm a Christian. I follow Christ as well. Um, but at right. the end of the day, that doesn't make me any better than anybody else. Um, right. I just, uh, you know, I've come to a place in my life where I understand some things that, uh, that, that make sense to me. And that's where I live and go. I mean, I should be good as well. And uh, I probably could give you a run for your money on the failure options there. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, that's I funny. I like that. Oh, buddy. Yeah. I mean, maybe today. That's funny. <laughs> it's not even today, but uh, there is a there is a big big opportunity in in what it means to understand that relationship. And uh, mm. it has nothing to do with bashing anybody's religion or, or faith. No, 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 no. I, I can care less. It comes down to a lot it's of times people are just afraid to talk about things. And, you know, I don't yeah. see the reason why. You know? can, can I give you an interesting answer on that one, right? I'll give you an interesting answer. I can, I can talk a lot. So I come from um, an Iranian background. as an Iran, right? Persian background, right? And so I was born in Australia, but had quite a, you know, Middle Eastern upbringing, right? Very Middle Eastern upbringing. And... What I find interesting about it is that, and I have this conversation all the time. I've got a lot of friends from all different faiths. Um, and I've got a lot of Middle Eastern friends. And in, the, in, in Australia, there's a lot of Middle Eastern people and descendants in Australia. And it's 50-50, half of it usually. So I make half a Christian. Whatever, don't care, right? But what's interesting, though, is in the Middle East, and in, I, use, I use Middle East and India as an example, right? I've got a lot of Indian friends and Middle Eastern friends, right? A lot of Indian and Middle Eastern people in Australia, doesn't it? What's interesting is that if you talk to people from in Indian backgrounds or the Middle East, talking about God is normal. And this is what I find the difference between a lot of one thing about the West. When you're in the West, talking about God is a bit taboo. It's like, oh, we can't talk about that. Oh, God's just terrible. Naughty, naughty. In the Middle East and India, talking about God is like talking about coffee. It's just a normal. It's normal to openly talk about god we're in the west it's this weird taboo about it which i disagree with i think it's wrong i think i think well, you it know, didn't need to be that way it's it's becoming that over the past few years and uh, it will continue oh, really? to get worse oh yeah oh yeah it, okay. it's quite more open than that but uh in the past i'd say within the past 20 years some things have have taken a turn and it's nothing that the bible hasn't talked about anyway and 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 it's not going to get any better it's actually going to get worse um, that's another another story. But uh, the reality is, is like you know, it, it, the world we're living in right now 
And the people that we get to live with and deal with and experience here, especially, you know, you and I are primarily going to be talking about folks on LinkedIn. And we both have Facebook presence, right? But a lot of folks here are going to be listening to this from LinkedIn. And it's quite a vast, uh, a vast group of people on LinkedIn, which I think is right. People. I love the, the flavor we have there. And I, I love the gratitude. I love the openness. I love some of the freedom that's there that uh, you don't get over at the drama book. I mean, Facebook <laughs> as much as the drama you, book. I like it. Oh. <laughs> as much as you get over at LinkedIn, right? So uh, yeah. that's what makes it fun for me to have so many different friends. But anyway, we've taken a big left turn from where we were supposed to be originally. And, and I want to kind of come back into the fact to say thank you so much for sharing some of your stories. Thank you from uh, when you uh, were a kid growing up into uh, in Australia to be able to experience some of the things you had through the military, your difficulties, and how you were able to overcome some of those things, uh, which were several things you have to overcome, especially some of the big battles you had inside your own heart, your own head, uh, mm. to overcome the issues that could have defeated you that was yourself. You were your worst enemy at that point. And oh, it's a, totally, absolutely. No, no doubt about it. I completely blame myself. Yeah, but you had that hope revealed. And for you, you said to me, if I understand correctly then, your hope revealed was the fact that you had, you had an outlet the entire time. You had an opportunity through a relationship with God in prayer that, yes. that got you through those moments. That was your hope. That was your hope revealed was, was that relationship. And it's funny you bring that up, Matt, because when I, um, so when I ended up, when I realized, Ed, you're actually now homeless, I actually was not worried because I kind of knew it was a cleaning slate, a clean slate opportunity, right? I kind of knew that. And I look back and again, I, I'll tell you now, there are at least 10 people who I've helped prevent from committing suicide, at least 10, right? It's probably way more than that. These are the 10 I know about. So here's the point. If I just stayed as a marketing manager, those 10 people would probably be dead. So again, it's sort of like the whole experience. So just by me doing my business, I've saved the lives of at least 10 people. That's pretty cool. I like it. Let's go yeah. save another 100 now. Yeah, yeah, so let's, no, yeah. let's increase my positive body count. Hi, I'm Edward count. Zia, and I've saved 10 people's lives, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. I want to save more people's lives. Yeah, it's so good. It's great. All right, so Edward, how, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, what exactly? Tell me if you can. What you, do. Um, you know, you have this new marketing company that's fairly new, and there's a lot of things you do with that. Um, I don't want to go into another half an hour explanation of what that is, but you know, give me a brief example of what, what that is, a, a synopsis, and then how people can get a hold of you and, and what the, the heartbeat is behind that whole thing. Oh, well, first thing is um, for anyone out there, please add me on LinkedIn. Um, just when you hit the connect key, just say Matt Crump is attractive and handsome. If you say that, <laughs> so you have to say Matt Crump is attractive and handsome. Okay. Say that in the message and I'll know who you are and I'll hit accept on LinkedIn. Right? <laughs> so, so how does it go? Matt Crump is attractive and handsome. Put that in and I'll hit the accept key. It's a new right, algorithm so now on LinkedIn. It's a secret trick. <laughs> yeah, we call it the MC algorithmic hack. Right, we call it that, right? I love the MC it's algorithm. Yeah. Anyway, um, but no, please have me on LinkedIn. But seriously, um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a marketing mentor and master coach, and I help people become master persuaders and influencers, and it's what I'm all about. So, um, best thing out there is, yeah, please have me on LinkedIn. Google my name. Um, when you reach out to me, there's heaps of free resources I can send you uh, to help you, uh, you know, become a better persuader and influencer, so you can achieve the life and business that you want. Fantastic. I appreciate that. And is there a uh, zero specific? Uh, website you have oh yeah um best best thing for people is just type my name into google um just go past america's most wanted and the cia no fly list <laughs> and then you'll see my website and stuff like that so don't look uh, at america most wanted just avoid that so yeah, just avoid don't, that one don't worry just about that yeah, yeah don't worry about that that's that was, nothing that, that's that's fake news it's lies it's all fake lies <laughs> oh my gosh there you go no, seriously folks. just go, just google my name get in contact and remember, your winners on every level, you're great. <laughs> there you go, folks. There's my buddy Edward today. So glad you're able to join us here on Hope Revealed and uh, spend the time we've been able to spend together here sharing some some really great and fun stories. Uh, Matt, it's a pleasure. And I just want to say this again. Matt, I'm amazed at how attractive and beautiful your viewers are, Matt. Yeah, there's some good-looking folks out there. Very attractive people. Absolutely. And I love my wife. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Bless your hearts. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got to have that little Edward Zia thing at the end. So, so Bless what is the one heart. thing you always tell people? What is your tagline you say? And I love your work. There it is. And then you've recently asked it in the past six months. Yeah, it's your really lovely work, but now I say, bless your hearts. Yes, you did. And you do. That's awesome. And you do bless my heart. I appreciate you being here today so much, buddy. Well, thank you. It's an oh, honor. Yeah. It's an okay. absolute I've enjoyed this. I'm looking forward to the re- when the recording comes out. Yeah, me too. It's going to take me six years to edit, but that's fine. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean. <laughs> 